It's my pleasure to welcome you here to the Clark Howard Show, where our mission is to serve you with advice and info that empowers you to make better financial choices in your life. You know, I've never been a fan of brand names, and it seems that I was just ahead of the curve because private labels are growing in share in retail and in food, big time. Okay, so listen to this. More than 25% of sales now in the grocery store are private label. Forever in the United States, those sales were about 15% of what people bought. And now, it's gone way up. I mean, do you think about moving market share one point is a big deal in business. Private label going from 15 to 20, over 25% is a big move. And it goes to something that I talked about months ago, the buyer's strike. And we were already seeing it in different phases of retail. It's now solid in restaurants and in grocery that consumers have had enough And they're fighting back in different ways. And the private label thing is a big thing in this with market share moving so heavily. Um, Walmart recognizes this and is copying from Target's playbook and is coming out with a new premium food line. Um, I forget what, what it's called at Target. They have these really great ice cream sandwiches I buy that are in their premium brand name, whatever that is. They're so good. They're like chocolate cookies with vanilla ice cream in the middle, and they're they're really outstanding. Anyway, I digress, because when it comes to, to ice cream, I mean, that's the most important thing in my life. No, not really, but I love it. Um, so Walmart's coming out with better goods. Because as I've made fun of great value in the past, great value, Walmart's primary private label for food, a lot of the great value food is not such great food. It may be cheap, but it tastes cheap. So Walmart, through the process of having the delivery with Walmart Plus, has a lot of people buying groceries from them for delivery who themselves don't walk in a store. They tend to be higher income, and they're looking for a higher quality private label. And Walmart is taking advantage of this big move from uh, from people moving from brand name goods to private label, and they're launching this line of better goods. And supposedly they're going to be much better quality. They're starting with only 300 items in the grocery aisle. And if it works, there'll be a lot more. And I just don't, you brought up favorite day. Is that it? Favorite day is the, thank you for bringing that up. That's the favorite day ice cream sandwiches that just think about how fantastic that is. I hope I'm not making your mouth water right now with the chocolate cookies on each side and then the vanilla ice cream in the middle it is really awesome so i'm so surprised i have to say as a target shopper as we've talked about they own 45 private label brands yeah i think that's a dumb strategy and i'm looking i didn't realize all of these were owned by them i thought they were outside companies selling through them but yeah so target um did that with women's clothing Mm -hmm. where they'd have the different brands you know it's a completely different strategy than like um, Costco and Sam's have done with Members Market, Sam's, Kirkland Signature at Costco. You see it, you know it's Sam's private label, Costco's private label. When you have, you said 40? 45. 45. I think that's uh, some marketing people who don't have enough to do because you can't build that name recognition. Think about it. I couldn't remember the name Mm -hmm. of the premium ice cream line because 
There are just too many of these private. But Target can run its business however yeah. it wants. But you know who uh, we talked about the other day that's reporting really bad numbers. You know, the, the restaurants have had more inflation than the grocery stores. Their prices are up 33% over the last five years. 33%. And consumers are like, no, I'm not doing it. Their sales are down at so many restaurant chains. And Starbucks stock collapsed when they reported a giant drop in sales. And people just aren't having it. Starbucks kept pushing the prices up and up and up. And I think I mentioned the other day they're now doing discounts in the app right, for, for people who are not whatever their reward C thing is mm -hmm. because they're losing the casual person who comes in and they, they buy something and they get the bill and it's like, wait a minute, I just got a, a half-calf, decaf, tall, <laughs> short, grande something and it was eleven dollars or whatever it is and they're not coming back and so they're trying to lure people back with deals mcdonald's is having to offer a better value proposition than they've been because their customers are saying wait a minute guys um and uh, and when i was just in california lane and i um went to eat at a fast food restaurant and the fast food for the two of us, this was not a quick serve. This was regular fast food. How much was it for a simple meal for the two of us? I don't know. Is this in and out It was not in and out Oh, okay. $21. Wow, that's crazy. Where was it? A McDonald's. Wow. Yeah, I held the name till the end because oh I wanted gosh. the price. So people are really feeling it. And so the buyer's strike is the power you have in the marketplace. You know, Procter & Gamble or Kraft or whatever they're called now, Mandela's, whatever. Anyway, and uh, Coca-Cola and Pepsi run these prices up. You have power. And the power is you don't buy what they're selling. That's how you signal to Procter & Gamble that Tide may, you may like that, it, you may think it cleans your clothes a little better, but should you be paying three times the price of a store brand or whatever it is? Probably not. So think about when you're shopping, be intentional. You know, shopping tends to be an emotional thing. Which item you pick up, what brand you pick up, what's familiar to you from advertising. You want to dial back the cost of things? You think about where you shop, and when you're shopping there, what you buy. And we do have an article on Clark.com called How to Save Money on Groceries, 22 Clever Ways. And what's so funny is if we write a story about that during a time where people are feeling really happy in the wallet, nobody clicks on it. When we write about it right now, when people are really upset about how much things cost, it's almost like a clickbait headline. Well, People your audience is always interested in saving money, so we don't really have that problem. Okay. All right, we're going to go to questions now. RJ in New Hampshire says, I'm vacationing in Munich, and I visited my first Lidl. It was quite great, and I had to let you know of a deal I got over here. Coffee filters, a pack of 100 <laughs> for just under a dollar after the exchange. I grabbed five packs and figured I could fit more, so I got five more. Might be a little odd explaining it to customs, but hey, I spent under $10 for a year and a half of coffee filters. Plus, I got lunch there almost each day, and the food is great. I just thought I'd let you know of the sort of travel deal I got. So, RJ, uh, you and I are kindred spirits. <laughs> the last time I was in Japan, I went to the 100 yen store, and I bought 10 small umbrellas and brought them back. Nobody asked me anything at security or, or customs, but they were such a deal. And I'm going to Japan again soon, and I've already thought through I'm going to the 100 yen store, and I'm buying more umbrellas. <laughs> Maureen in New York says, I had heard last summer that in Sweden, a consumer can buy his or her own mortgage at a discount if they have the money. I called my credit union to see if they would sell me my own mortgage as opposed to me paying the payoff amount, and they said no. 
I argued that it's good for them because they could use the money to lend out at a higher rates and it would be good for me because I would get a discount. But the branch manager said the credit union wouldn't do it. Have you heard of these types of arrangements? Yeah, nothing like this, uh, as I know of, has ever been done in the United States. And you're, you're paying net present value for your mortgage. All they'll let you do in the United States is pay off your mortgage and uh, if you've got a really low mortgage rate, you don't want to do that. All right. Paul in Ohio says, I am 44 and retired a few years ago in law enforcement with my wife's permission and encouragement. <laughs> she didn't want to worry about you uh, being out there. You gave me the knowledge to amass over $1.5 million in savings and retirement. Great. Our house and cars are paid off and we have no debt. I currently have $280,000 in a 457B account. With the stock market volatility, I placed my funds into a stable value fund earning around 3% interest. I don't need the money at this time, but I'm debating whether I should take a lump sum withdrawal and take the tax hit now and place it into my savings account where I can just earn just over 5% interest. The other option is to take out monthly withdrawals, but I'm charged $55 a quarter for administrative fees. Wow, wow, $220 a year to get your own money. Yep. My wife and I have been researching and crunching numbers for weeks. We still couldn't decide what our best option would be. That's when we locked eyes and she said the following two words, ask Clark. Well, all right, so if you're gonna ask me, you're 44 years old. You need your money to last potentially another 50 years. Think about that. More than the lifetime you've already had, more than that left. That's very possible that you'll live to 90-something. So if you think that way, the 280 you've got in the 457 you got in stable value, Stable value is kind of like, uh, kind of like an insurance company savings account. I don't like them uh, because you're not at a point in your life that you want your money to just sit uh, at or trailing inflation. I would like your money invested, and by invested, I mean in the 457B. You will have in it. Uh, like index funds, you might have target retirement funds. I'd much rather see the money in that. Um, as to withdrawing money to do fun things, uh, you could certainly pull some of it out uh, and use it for lifestyle kind of things. But I'd like to see most of it truly invested, not saved. You worry about the stock market? Yes. Stock market is always a risk short term, is a great bet long term. Is it a sure thing? Is it certain over the decades? Mathematically, pretty much yes, although there could always be an exception, which is why I would say it's a great bet. I wouldn't call it a sure thing, but it's what I'd like you to consider with a meaningful portion of that 457 money. Coming up ahead, I want to talk about something involving investment property for you that's really important that I gloss over from time to time. I want to hit you right between the eyes on it straight ahead. So there's something going on that is a clear movement around the country and not just in the United States. It's a strong backlash against people owning investment real estate that they rent out short term, Airbnb, VRBO, anything like that. And we had the move in New York that effectively banned Airbnb in New York City and totally disrupted the economic models of so many people who were doing those rentals. Well, now Hawaii has a new law that'll be up to each county, basically each island in Hawaii, if they are going to use the new powers granted by the state. I will be very surprised if any island in Hawaii does not adopt 
the banning of Airbnb and VRBO. The reason in the Hawaiian Islands became so stark after the tragic, tragic fires in Lahaina on the island of Maui, and that is that the island lacks so much available housing in ways it never did before Airbnb and VRBO existed. And I am guilty as charged. I have repeatedly, in the Hawaiian Islands, rented uh, not from Airbnb, but VRBO. And so I've been part of the problem in this severe housing shortage for locals, residents in the Hawaiian Islands. And we're going to see this with the housing affordability problem in the country. We're going to see this happen place after place after place where short-term rentals through Airbnb, VRBO, are going to be banned. So you can feel however you want to about this, but it's coming. It's happening from associations that are banning short-term rentals because it changes the character of a condominium community or resort community. It's happening from local governments, now happening from a state government. And so when you are looking at real estate with the idea of running your own business as an Airbnb host or VRBO host, know the risk to you if your business model gets blown apart because the rental you're doing is outlawed, is no longer allowed. What do you do? The key up front and if you've heard me say this in the past, I apologize. I sound like a broken record. There are a lot of people who've never heard my reasoning on this. If you're looking at buying an investment property to rent out and your business model is based on short term, also make sure that the math works that you can at least be on a break-even plus if you're forced to go to long-term rental. Know that when these conversions have happened, when local laws have been passed that ban short-term rentals, what happens is a lot of people having no working business model for being able to make money doing long-term rentals, that the money just isn't there enough, flood the market with properties for sale, and it leads to a temporary cycle of depressed prices on those properties. So you get hit twice. You get hurt with no longer being able to earn the money you earn from renting it out short term to people. And when you bail out, you get less money for the property because of the simple market forces that a lot of people like you who have short term rentals decide they're getting out. So remember the rule. The short-term rental property you're targeting, you're going to buy for that purpose. you got to be able to know that your exit strategy is not going to be hard if it also works as a for-profit event if you have to convert to long-term tenants only. Okay. Uh, speaking of that, Will in Wisconsin wrote in, said, owning a lakefront home has been on the bucket list since I saw On Golden Pond as a child but lakefront property has been soaring in price. A toe-in-the-water option I've seen is to purchase a condo at a lake resort. These seem to be discounted compared to the general market, and you can use their existing rental programs to offset the costs. I'm curious as to your take on this topic. A great deal versus HOA and fees that could put this in your never, ever, ever category? <laughs> no. Well, there's nothing wrong with owning a uh, condominium property versus owning a single family. There's a lot to be said positive for it because you're not responsible for all the exterior maintenance and upkeep on a remote property that you want to just be able to enjoy and pick up some defraying of the cost by having it in a rental pool. What is a problem is the cycle we're in. 
So what happens when the economy is as strong as it's been is you have a lot of people who normally uh, might not desire a second home at a lake, at a mountain, at a beach, whatever. Those prices get bid up during strong economic times. I mean, think how low our unemployment rate has been. And there's also, we're also in another K economy. I, you know, we were, I forget what year we were in a K economy before, where there's a real divide how people are doing financially right now. And people at the higher end of the income ladder are doing better right now significantly overall than people at lower levels of the income, which is why it's called the K. And so second home properties are unusually overheated in price right now. And this is going to sound terrible, but timing is your friend. I'm not normally into timing anything. Timing is your friend with second homes. And it's your enemy right now. So if you can hold off for a while for an economic cycle to turn, think what happens when the economy gets more difficult. Do people dump their primary home? No. They dump their vacation home. And that's where the opportunity will be most present with the cycles. I mean, you know, traditional primary residences hold pretty um, steady values. Vacation homes go up and down like severe ocean waves. So this is a bad cycle to buy. And then also we'll mention the rental program. So what you said earlier applies. Yeah. Okay. Regina in Georgia says VRBO question. Oh. We are renting a house in Destin for a week in June. It is being managed by the owners, not a management company. They are requesting the name, date of birth, and license number of every adult staying with us to them to send to them before the final payment. We have eight adults, all family members. Is there danger in sending this information? They didn't ask for license plates or car models. I'm not comfortable with sending all this information and all in the years I've rented in all the years I've rented with VRBO, this is a first. Yeah, so landlords are asking for more personal information about who all is staying in a property than they used to. And it's because of the problems they've had with properties getting trashed or uh, unfortunate incidents happening at, happening at properties. And the landlords more and more want more and more level of personal information as part of renting a place. If you think about it, if you were renting a long-term apartment, they want every bit of information about you imaginable. You go to a doctor's office now. What do they do first? They do a copy of your driver's license. And there's a lot of piercing of personal privacy and personal information. The information that they're asking for, Regina, is dangerous if it fell in the wrong hands. Because with uh, date of birth, name, license number, that's some of the stuff that would be really helpful to an identity thief. So the question I would ask this uh, this host, VRBO, right? Mm -hmm. I'd ask the VRB host, is if you supply this, do they have a procedure for destroying it after, you know, shredding the copies of this information after you have left? which would be a reasonable thing to ask for. And it would be, all that information is on the driver's license anyway. In her state. Right, that's true. So it's like giving them your license. Okay, Dalton in Oklahoma says, Clark, I'm a newer listener as a friend of mine recommended your podcast a few months ago. Welcome. I do not have a question, but more of a suggestion. I've heard several questions or concerns about additional properties and what they should do when their time arises. When someone inherits a property or has a secondary property that are not their primary residence, you should discuss the pros and cons of a 1031 exchange. Yes, you are on a timeline and need to find a different property within 180 days, but if one is not found, you can always roll funds into a DST and utilize those funds at a later date. And we've had I lots of questions. I think that's a Delaware statutory trust, if I'm going by okay. memory. I'll check it out. And look up DST. I think that's what well, that we, stands for. We have for. had several questions. A lot of, uh, all through the years, I've had a lot of questions about 1031s. So the primary purpose regularly of a 1031 Dalton 
is, uh, you know this, but I'll say to others, allows you to sell an investment property and move the money into another property and defer paying capital gains tax on the property you already have. Uh, in the case of somebody inheriting one, that is treated pretty much as an investment property. And so you can, after you effectively gain ownership of a property, you can also, in that case, do a 1031 exchange. So let's say you don't want that property. This is a complicated process, but you can move that property into another property that you've identified within 45 days and closed on within 180 days. And Krista, I was right on the Delaware Statutory Trust. You were. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's a procedure. Uh, Dalton, you're obviously a sophisticated real estate investor. That's a procedure people go through in order to be able to defer the tax on the, the sale of a property and avoid paying the capital gains tax. The one thing about an inherited property, I'd say though, Dalton, there are going to be times that because of the stepped up basis, stepped up value and basis at the time you inherit a property, you may not be subject to capital gains. So there's an advantage if you're going to sell it, you sell it and you receive the money tax free. This would be a circumstance when you're trying to figure out what to do with an inherited property as quickly as your grief allows, and please allow it to do so quickly because time is of the essence, you want to meet with a real estate lawyer. And if you don't have an accountant, CPA who does tax, you would like the services of one to make sure you handle that properly so that you minimize or at least defer the tax if that's your goal. And Dalton, I appreciate the suggestion, and I hope that you have an absolutely great day. Tomorrow is going to be Clark Stinks, where you get to hear where people are unhappy with advice, guidance, or opinions I've given. One thing that I think we can all agree on is how valuable it is to be able to get one-on-one -on -one advice you can trust. And we have that for you. 30 hours each week, you can talk with a member of Team Clark and get free one-on-one -on -one advice and guidance, something we have done for 31 plus years. And you can see how to do that to get that one-on-one -on -one advice if you go to clark.com slash CAC and see you tomorrow.